माता है आनंद की जननी माता है आनंद की जननी प्रेम शक्ति से सूरज तारे गतिबद्ध कर घुमा रही माता है आनंद की जननी माता है आनंद की जननी प्रेम शक्ति से सूरज तारे गतिबद्ध कर घुमा रही माता है आनंद की जननी वे ही तो उल्लास हर्ष जो विद ग्रंथी को खोल रही वे ही तो सौंदर्य बोध की गुह आत्मा इंद्रिय जगत को हर्षित करती रस से भरती उनमें ही संपूर्ण सत्य का सार अर्थ है माता है आनंद की जननी माता है आनंद की जननी प्रेम शक्ति से सूरज तारे गतिबद्ध कर घुमा रही माता है आनंद की जननी आई है वे उतर निकट आनंद रिक्त मानवता में आकर्षण के पास बांध कर खींच रही वे हमें हमारी दुर्बलता में दुख पीड़ा से भरे मनुज के जग को आनंद धाम में बदल रही दीप्ति मय उनकी मुस्कान माता है आनंद की जननी माता है आनंद की जननी प्रेम शक्ति से सूरज तारे गतिबद्ध कर घुमा रही माता है आनंद की जननी ज्ञात नहीं हम कर पाते कि कब और कैसे लांघ गए उनके प्रभाव से दुर्बलता के सारे बंधन लावण्यमय उनके स्वरूप का ध्यान करो हे आतुर मन लावण्यमय उनके स्वरूप का ध्यान करो हे आतुर मन उनके अद्भुत चरण कमल के चुंबन को जो खींच ला रहा ऊषा को हे हृदय चलो अब स्वागत करने हे हृदय चलो अब स्वागत करने शीघ्र कहीं वे मुड़ ना जाए शीघ्र कहीं वे मुड़ ना जाए नहीं बलात प्रवेश करेंगे संकोच भरी हमारी आराध्या माता है आनंद की जननी माता है आनंद की जननी प्रेम शक्ति से सूरज तारे गतिबद्ध कर घुमा रही माता है आनंद की ज
जननी माता है आनंद की जननी आनंद की जननी आनंद की जननी Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. Namaste, Dr. Basuti Bhattacharya. Nice to have you once more in the Yes family. Thank you. You just heard uh, an invocation of the Divine Mother, the Mother who is uh, the source of all delight and ananda in the universe. And uh, the voice was that of Dr. Mithupal. The lyrics were also by one of our own, Dr. Alok Pandey. Now request uh, Aditi to introduce the speaker of the day, Dr. Bhaswati Bhattacharya, for those uh, who haven't heard her earlier. Welcome everyone. Welcome Dr. Bhattacharya. So just uh, briefly introduce her. Dr. Bhattacharya is a Harvard educated uh, licensed uh, physician trained in family and preventive medicine. Uh, her love for Ayurveda led her to complete a mid-career PhD in Ayurvedic chemistry in, from Banaras Hindu University. She has been dividing her time between Manhattan, Paris, and Banaras. She has been a Fulbright scholar, award, an awarded educator, and uh, a well-published scientist as well as an author. Her book, uh, Everyday Ayurveda, really brings the infinite wisdom of Ayurveda to everyday practical life for individuals. She is also a clinical assistant professor at a university in New York, and uh, her uh, institute, Dincharya, also based in New York, brings the wisdom of Ayurveda to everyday life of people. Today, uh, she will be talking to us about the qualities of food, the nutrition which the Ayurvedic qualities bring. We welcome you, Dr. Bhattacharya, and really look forward to your session. Over to you. Thank you to Dr. Bijlani, Dr. Aditi, and all of you who are here today. A little bit morning, uh, actually, Saki, which is the new year for, I think, five or seven cultures of the hundred in India and all around the world. People who are Bengali, Kashmiri, Punjabi, we are saying Happy New Year, Happy Vaisakhi. So, Welcome to all of you to learn about one of the most important things to keep you nourished and happy in the new year, which is food. But not just food, I'm saying food because we're speaking in English, but we need to use some terms from other parts of the world in order to, uh, actually from Sanskrit, to uh, understand what food really is. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen and I actually am going to turn off my video because I am I don't know if you can see it, but the Ganga is right outside there. Can you see the Ganga there? So you've just seen the Ganga for the first time this year, if you're not living on it. And I'm up very high uh, in the mountains near the source of the Ganga, which is called Gangotri. So uh, the signal is not so good. So I'm going to turn off my video and share my screen. And so, if you would like to write to me, you can copy down this email address and you can quickly take a screenshot if you'd like. Let me just get rid of some of this uh, extra stuff. And uh, as uh, Dr. Aditi mentioned, I have been doing quite a few things around Ayurveda for the last few years. I am a medical doctor, so I do tend to get a lot of students who ask scientific questions. And we will have a chance to uh, answer some of those questions. I request you to put your questions in the chat. And I give Aditi permission if someone asks a very uh, pertinent question that's of this moment, we should ask it now. I am not a teacher who prefers to go all the way to the end and take questions because um, if you ask something, it might come up in a slide in five minutes, but I'd rather say that to you than to have your mind disengaged because you're still trying to figure out that one thing that uh, you're, you know, you're hungering to know. 
So I began with obeisance to my gurus. The ones on the left are more biomedical and uh, modern medicine oriented. And I certainly um, have spent several moments, several years, um, learning things that don't work, learning things that are medical and very vogue and very um, uh, money producing and very status giving, but they don't work. Which is why I was led to understand some of the deeper philosophies of our ancient ancestors who got it right, but somehow what they got wrong is that they didn't share it enough for the conquerors uh, who tried to decimate it um, to be able to survive that. So uh, on the right side, I have people who, there's my mother and father, but I have the people who have helped me to learn Ayurveda, uh, and yoga and some of the other sciences. So the overview that we have today is we're going to talk about food, some of the terminology, and oops, and what is evidence-based uh, food, and how Ayurveda calls evidence, and then what is not food. We're going to talk about some of the myths of food and how other disciplines in food sciences, nutrition, diet would look at it, and how do other disciplines demonstrate their efficacy? What's their evidence? And then we'll talk about some of the things that work clinically. So as you're listening to this, you can personalize it to what you know, what you eat, and what you think is right, rather than trying to understand something that you're completely not um, oriented to or that you don't believe in. And then what's missing in today's understanding, we'll go through that as well. So, First, we need to remember, and I think all of you are learning some Ayurveda, so you know this. We need to remember that there are many modalities for treatment. Treatment is not just a pill, dava, as they say, or um, English medicine, where you just give a pill or you give a surgery and then that's it. And that's your treatment. And the person gives you a prescription for either 10 days, three months, come back and evaluate, six months, come back and evaluate or for the rest of your life because you're gonna have high blood pressure or thyroid for the rest of your life. We um, don't actually use that prescription because we know that people heal at different levels and that we know that they need to have uh, what we'll call, re, uh, it's called upashaya. So it's really about checking what's going on for you and rechecking it. So. In all of these modalities, we are going to use them simultaneously to modulate the way the doshas are swiftly or slowly moving through your body. And um, if I get cut off, it says my internet connection is unstable. So please write in the chat if you can't hear me. And if I do get cut off, I'll be back immediately, uh, hopefully. Okay. so. Of all of these modalities, these are the most subtle energy on the bottom fourth. The third area is stuff that's very unique to Ayurveda, but not understood by medical sciences of the modern world. These, the second section are the modalities which are understood as CAM, complementary alternative medicine. And the first level are now becoming what modern medicine calls lifestyle medicine. So they are starting to co-opt Ayurveda, even though they can't call it Ayurveda, they call it lifestyle medicine. And then modern medical doctors are saying, no, this is our right to use modern uh, concepts of lifestyle medicine. So we're gonna talk about Ahara. And, um, Uh, let's see, I, you guys just disappeared. Someone just uh, unmute and confirm for me that you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in the first part, we need to understand, since we're talking about food, we need to understand actually terminology. So I'm going to go back to this slide and look at these three words. Anna, Ahara, Bhojana. If it was Anna or Anna, it would be uh, one end. Anna means those particles of food, generally they refer to grains, but they're things that actually build up the tissues of your body. They are actual uh, nutrients. They're not Lay's potato chips or a Snickers bar. They are things which have proven 
um, benefits in the human body to build up the tissues, the muscle, the, you know, the organs and the health of the person. Ahara, A is long A, so not a short A like Anna, but Ahara. So think of robot versus the word but, A uh versus A. Uh. So Ahara is anything we take in that will um, come into our being. It can be useful, it can be non-useful. So if you take a cigarette and you smoke it, you're actually, that's part of Ahara because you're bringing that into your body. If you get a hug from someone and you feel deep love, that's also ahara. It's something you're taking into your body. So when we talk about taking things into our body, generally people say, oh yeah, you mean food. So we could mean food, but ahara is everything you take in. Hara means to lose. So ahara is not to lose, but to gain, to take into your being, into your koshas, your, uh, not just your anna maya kosha, but all of the levels of your being uh, can be affected. And bhojana refers to a meal. So those are the three words that are generally used for food. Next to that in the title, as you saw, was anna swarupa. So this word swarupa, swa means self and rupa means the qualities of, or the kind of um, look of. So those qualities of the self, which means the self of the food. So anna swarupa is what are the qualities of the food? So we go back to this slide where we have to think about first, how do we take in the nutrients? Now, if you look in these three columns, the one on the right is most familiar to those of you who have learned some physiology, either in medical school or nutrition school or even biology uh, bachelor's level. You learn about the gut and you learn about the mouth through the esophagus down into the upper stomach, lower stomach, and through all of these intestines, past the appendix, up ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, rectum, anus. And so the food goes out like this. And then there are these organs that help. There's a pancreas, there's a liver, and there's a spleen behind it. There's a bunch of organs that are helping. The one that they don't mention is the omentum, which is a fat layer right in front that they used to think is just fat, but it actually has a lot of immune um, elements. And down here along the colon, there are patches uh, called the GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is right here, and Peyer's patches, which are patches of the immune system that all over the immune system. These are coming into play now with the um, understanding that there's a microbiome, and I'll, I'll show you that article as we go through, but you need to understand this is the way that modern medicine sees everything, and if you do anything outside of this, you're either wrong, stupid, or ignorant. And that's really tough if you are trying to understand Ayurvedic concepts of nutrition, because even today in medical schools of Ayurveda, the teachers, because they had to pass 10th grade biology to take you know, either the NEAT exam, the medical entrance exam, or to get into the Ayurvedic exam, they have learned modern biology, modern physiology. Okay, meanwhile, go to what's objective, if you open up the body, you'll see that from mouth to anus, there are all of these different organs. And these organs are kind of different by their histology. So you take pieces of them, put them under a microscope, and the cells look slightly different. But Ayurveda talked about it in terms of this, which is um, the Ayurvedic anatomic physiologic integrated understanding of the way the gut works. And so there are vatas, which are called vayus, pittas and kapas that go through each part of the gut and the different functions. And if we go into this in detail for a couple of hours, we will be able to resolve all of your, uh, what we'll call misunderstandings or other understandings. So there are things in here, like I just pointed to clay, the kapa, this is an antacid that's produced in this very upper part right here of your stomach so that the acid doesn't fly up this way and get into your esophagus. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in some people who have hyperacidity or what's called acid reflux. It refluxes out of this area where all the digestion is happening, if you can see the lower part of the stomach, and goes up into that area. 
And what people do is they say, well, if there's acid, I'll take an antacid. And Ayurveda says, no, try to understand your physiology a little bit better and realize that that antacid has a purpose. And if you give an external antacid, that natural antacid, which we call Kledaka Kapha, is going to start disappearing from its own, um, what we can say, the, uh, the productive, um, um, functional, physiologic use of that. So like that, we can go through all of them. The one that you should learn is this word Jatar Agni, right here. Jatar Agni is the main fire. Sometimes it's called Pacha Kapita. Pacha or Paka means to cook. So it is that fire in the belly that cooks. And if you open up the belly, you're not going to see a little campfire. What you're going to see is a series of digestive enzymes and maybe you know, the, the gas and the solid and the liquid of a chemical reaction that you would see in the laboratory, but it's in a physiologic space of the lower stomach and higher small intestine. And so understanding the physiology of each of the pittas, each of the vatas and each of the kapas is very, very important for understanding how to interpret some of the things that I'm gonna share with you next. Um, I said that was the last thing I would mention, but I'm also gonna mention the word creamy. Creamy does not mean parasite or worm as it does in the regional Indian languages. It actually means any kind of non-visible to the human eye, non-visible uh, element, which um, either works with the body, against the body, or um, helps the body in a way the body absolutely needs it. And that is the microbiome. And so this, this uh, purisha means stool, kakrimi means microbes. It's really the uh, gut microbiome that they were talking about a thousand years ago before modern medicine discovered it in like 2003. So understanding ahara and how we take in nutrients has to do with the chemical idea of enthalpy, which is the energy. Now, if you look at how modern medicine and the disciplines and the food sciences look at it, they take a piece of food like here, and they simply uh, burn it in a crucible that's closed and they say, okay, how much heat was generated? And they measure it and they say, all right, that's how many calories it has. Calorie means uh, uh, energy. And so if calories are energy and those energies are provided by food, they measured that, well, carbohydrates, one gram has four calories and protein four and fat has nine. And so if you have energy in and you eat this much, then you're going to have energy in your body and it's going to store up and become fat unless you do the same amount of energy out expending calories as you eat in calories. And this fulcrum is the way that modern medicine shows it. Energy in equals energy out. And so this is what the doctor will talk about. Kilojoules and calories are the same word, but doctors will call it one way and they'll explain it with a bunch of numbers. Ayurveda says, wait, it's not what you eat. It's not the calories that are in the food. The food is also processed after you check the calories and no one is accounting for that. So if you have fresh broccoli, but you spritz some citric acid on it, to keep it from um, oxidizing, or you package it in a plastic, and that plastic uh, has a small amount of fumes as the plastic like shrink wraps, then you're changing the energy in that food. Also, time will change it. So Ayurveda says it's not what you eat, it's what you digest. And so uh, you have to remember that. So Ayurveda says it's not about what eat, it's how much agni your body can produce to create the heat and the digestion so that you can glow. So you can glow with energy and you have the power to be able to take whatever you eat and transform it from material food into energy that flows through your body. So how does Ayurveda look at it? Ayurveda says, that, sorry, I'm having some uh, internet issues. I hope you can still hear me. Um, it says, let's look at the way in which food works and the ingredients. So I'm gonna start with the ingredients because that's what conventional people understand. And then we'll move into the way in which it works. So if you go to most of the classic Ayurvedic texts, but the Charaka Samhita and the Yangrudayam are two of the main ones. Here's a copy of the Ishtanga Hridayam that um, I use in my classes. <coughs> there are two chapters 
and go through ingredient by ingredient foods. And so here's a nice montage of many of them, but the foods, we always start with soya or water. And then we go through the milks. We talk about dairy milk, which is cow milk, not a buffalo or a goat or any of the others, but cow milk and how that is medicinal when you turn it to yogurt and then turn it, churn it actually to butter and then heat that to make ghee. That is the only medicinal form of the milk products. So think about what you're eating that's not cow milk based and clean cow milk. So we can have a whole conversation about what clean cows are. And then all the different sugar-based sweetening um, foods, which are actually nutritive. These are not just things that taste good. These are the things that are nutritive and how to process sugar cane so it's nutritive. Honey as its own subject, because while it's sweet, it actually is not sweet. It's astringent and has very strong scraping properties. It's actually one of the best medicines for diabetes if you understand how to use it for someone that's having excess sugar in their blood. And they talk about oils, alcohol, vinegar. They talk about the medicinal use of eight kinds of urine, which none of you should do unless you understand how to use it as a medicine. Um, but I include it in there because cow urine is actually a very potent medicine, which um, many people in India use, but because Westerners are so grossed out by it, we generally don't talk about it with Westerners. If they can't understand it and accept it, then why try to convince them? Because many of them are about bullying and conquesting for the last 500 years. So Indians have learned just not to talk about things that they actually do, that they don't need approval um, for. So um, and I think it's interesting because when I first arrived as an American doctor, people were very wary to show me things until they realized that I'm not here to conquer. And so uh, I began to learn some of the deeper secrets of using these as foods. These are all drava dravi, which means they flow, they're liquid or semi-liquid uh, in some way. So then we move into the solid foods and they include the grains, which are called sukha, which means a sharp awning uh, on of a grass. So it's the, the sharp grasses, which are all the cereals. So it includes rice, wheat, corn. And if you have ever been in a field of grain, uh, an amber field of grain, you can feel the, how the grains are sharp and they will cut your hands or your skin against you. So that's what shuka means. Then there are the simbi dhanya, which are the pulses, the cooked foods, meats, which yes, Ayurveda does talk about meats as medicine. So it's not that Ayurveda is all uh, vegetarian. And then they have a whole section on vegetables and then fruits, the salts that we use to make foods tasty and then medicinal herbs. And we go through these one by one, shloka by shloka, uh, which was actually quite a lot of work for me because I never learned this in modern medical school. But it was such a, a homework and a delight to learn about this and then to uh, translate this for my students who had never gotten this. We also got a bunch of Ayurvedic ideas from India in these courses, um, these uh, online sessions, because in their medical school, they had kind of, learned about the vitamin C and the different folate levels and uh, calories by carbohydrate fat, which are obviously not Ayurvedic, they're modern interpretations. And there are certain parts of the country that really teach their Ayurveda students the modern side without teaching them the traditional way of looking at them, which I'm just going to show you in a moment. So when I went through these shloka by shloka, it was amazing how the Ayurvedic uh, participants, the Vaidya participants, had never seen, seen this before in their medical school, and it transformed them. And it's been amazing to while they now practice because they understand foods from the Ayurvedic point of view. So if you want to read some of this on your own, there is not yet a good textbook according, like for a lay person to read or an advanced intellectual who's not a technical Ayurveda expert. This Bhava Prakash series, these are two different translations, is a really good book to use. It is in English. I won't say the English is completely um, well translated, but it's a good start. And it does help people to understand how uh, foods were looked at. There's also a book from the 11th century called the Paka Darpana of Nala. And this is, uh, it's not easy to read, but it has a lot of details that 
those of you who are chefs would find very interesting. And then there are two books from the Kutuhalam series, the Bhojana, Kutuhalam, Bhojana means meal, and the Kshema Kutuhalam. And they also have two different translations. So it's not that they aren't available, it's just that most people don't know about them. We are trying to uh, translate this. So a group of um, my students, my fellows actually, we have 10 fellows in Ayurvedic nutrition who are all Ayurvedic physicians, Vaidya's AMS um, by uh, requirement. And we are writing it into layperson friendly articles. So this one on Ranjika Pitta talks about the work of the liver. It uses technical terms, but explains them. We talk about the yoga of water. We talk about Golgritha, cow, cow ghee, moringa. So we have a bunch of articles that are up and I welcome you to this website, ayurveda.in because uh, many of you are gonna walk away from this and say, well, how can I read more about the ingredients? How can I learn more about the things we've just gotten a quick introduction to? I'll just take you through two slides of how we um, teach these foods. So these are all from these shlokas, Simbi Dhanya, as I mentioned, Shimbi is the pulses. Dhanya is anything that brings dhan, which means wealth. And as many of you know, the currency, the money kind of um, uh, trading that we had before coins, which are called mudras, before coins were around of metal, they used grains. So in the West, they were using, like the Aztec and Mayans were using corn, um, wheat, rice, these were exchanged for other goods. And so they have dhan in them. They have the idea of um, wealth or of you know, money. So the shimbi dhanya, the sukha dhanya were the grains, as I mentioned earlier. The simbi, shimbi dhanya are the pulses. And there are many pulses that are uh, detailed. So some of you may not know the difference between beans and legumes and pulses and dals and peas and grams and lentils. So we go through those. And basically you can say that if you dry those beans, they are called pulses. If you split them in half, if you open it up and you split it and it splits exactly into half, that's called a dicotyledon and it comes from its embryonic origin. Monocotyledon is where it doesn't split up. And if you look at it fresh, you'll call it a bean or a pea. If you look at it dry, you'll call it a pulse. So you'll see these are all dried. And of these, there are many different types that are used as dolls. So doll is when you split it in half, you take off, um, you, know, you take it away from its shell and then you cook it, that's called a doll. And so there are many different kinds of dolls and they have different names in all different parts of the world, which makes it of course, very confusing. So I, you know, I used to see Rajma and I said, that just looks like a kidney bean. There are slight species variations, but that basically looks like a kidney bean. And so it turns out that Raja Masha, which is Rajma, is basically the, called the kidney bean. You have to be a little bit careful because sometimes people do very uh, wrong translations. And uh, we've actually watched that in the salt. So when we talk about black salt, rock salt, and Himalayan salt, just last night in our master classes, we were just talking about how uh, people will get it, put a label on it and sell it as part of their own company. And they're just wrong. They're just absolutely no buts about it. They are wrong. Sindava salt, other kinds of salt. Same thing happens with the dolls. People are labeling dolls wrong because they're not connected to the way in which dolls were used and they're hybridizing and doing all kinds of stuff. So we talk about all these in, in detail and um, the summary of the dolls is that the most healthy doll you can have is the Moong doll, which is right here, this yellow one. And you can see this as a split doll, which is yellow, or you can look at it with the skin on, which is a whole bean. It's a green um, casing or a green shell. So this and this are the same. So it looks like this on the outside and this on the inside. That's the healthiest doll you can have, period. And it has a hundred different uses, both as a poultice and as a scrub and as a face wash, as a shampoo, but also in food as dal or in kitchery or in medicinal preparations. The worst dal you can have are urad dal, which are called, um, called urad, but 
uh, I guess you call them black gram or masha is the Sanskrit word. And these have a white inside, which you can see here. So this is the outside with the black. And if you cut open and take off this black shell, it looks like this. I hope you can see my cursor because I'm pointing to this in the slide. So that's the dolls. And let's talk about next the uh, fruits. So fruits are called phala because the Sanskrit word is fal, phala. And in the Ashtanga Hridayam, which is here in chapter six of the Sutrastam, which is the introductory section, there's a whole bunch of shlokas in chapter six about fruits. And I went through, I've never seen anyone do this, which kind of makes me wonder how um, Ayurvedic doctors learn. But I went through and I wrote out the names of all the different fruits and the ones which are easily known in the West, I uh, included. And actually I learned, um, you know, I'm, I'm a young baby uh, student learning about these different foods, but I learned that nuts are actually considered fruits, which they are botanically, but they're included in the fruit section of Ayurvedic texts. So the walnut is included there. There's about four or five nuts included there, including the uh, almond, the peanut, and the cashew. And then just the walnut. These four are, they didn't have Brazil nuts. And they didn't have macadamia. So you don't get information about those, but you do get about these others. There's another one that's not a snack nut that you'll have with your whiskey at happy hour, um, but it is a nut and it's called bhalataka, which is the marking nut. And it makes a, um, a mark on cloth or on, on um, surfaces. And so we use that as well as a nut. Okay, so when we talk about these, what we should learn is whether or not they're sour or sweet, because all fruits are not sweet. So the sour ones I've um, put into... Um, well, I put them into one color. I'm not sure you can actually see this that clearly, but there's a reddish orange and then there's a yellowish orange. The yellowish orange means that it's heating and we should be careful when we eat those. And they actually include some grape. Apologies, I just got cut off. Let me share my screen again. So, uh, if we look at, can someone just confirm that you can hear me? Anyone in the chat or you can unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, so as I was saying, the sour fruits um, and the heating fruits are important. So the ones that heat up the body are the papaya, the pineapple, the mango, and some of the grapes the green grapes. So, sorry, not green grapes. The green ones are, yeah, they're, they're a little bit more heating. The red ones are considered to be the healthier of the two different ones. And of course we know that grapes grow in so many different colors. You can see this. There are so many different types in the world. So we talk about each of these and we talk about the ones that are used more medicinally like the bail or the bilva fruit, which is one of panaceas for irritable bowel syndrome. It's sometimes called the bale fruit. And uh, we also have the banana, which is here. You can see the banana fruit and then the bananas growing. There used to be many different types that were actually very distinct from each other. So plantains are different from yellow bananas. But due to hybridization and trade, a lot of that um, has disappeared. And so in the Musa, M-U-S-A family, they've kind of mixed up. So this is the fala varga. These are, you know, and then you can see the pomegranate, um, which is one of the most healthy vegetables. And we actually use it for a bunch of different medicinal conditions, including heart disease. And also this white uh, rind or skin is very good for diarrhea. And I use it for diarrhea predominant irritable bowel patients. The reason I keep mentioning irritable bowel or IBS is because about 4% of doctors have IBS and many of my patients have IBS and they come to me because modern medicine has told them that it's permanent. And this didn't used to happen in India. Um, the USA had a very large lead time for it as well as people in Central Europe. But now it's spread to India and um, it's because of the modern foods and the westernized lifestyle. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. 
We also have classes on the oshana, which means the medicinal section of foods. And so I go through and I teach in a slightly different way by showing people um, what the different misrepresentations are of the food. So here's an example from Pure Indian Foods, which is a really great company in the US that um, helps people to learn about foods as they buy them. Here are all these different seeds and people get them mixed up. So the black sesame seed, which is a sesame, is very different from the onion seed, which is called palandu in Sanskrit, which is very different from nigella, which is this anti-cancer superfood, which is known as kalonji. But kalonji is not the same thing as black cumin, which is a different seed that's not even shown here. So this you know, is uh, something that people oftentimes don't understand. Another is about uh, um, the cardamom. There's the green cardamom and then the black cardamom. So anyone that's eaten biryani has seen these black cardamoms. And people who do uh, teas have oftentimes eaten these sweet cardamoms. We find it also in payasam, which is the rice pudding. Then there's different properties of ginger. So there's fresh ginger and there's dry ginger and they have totally different properties. Then there's different kinds of pepper. So the most expensive pepper, uh, many of you know that it used to be called black gold because pepper at one time about uh, 2000 years ago when trading happened between the Eastern Ocean and the Western Ocean. The Western Ocean was the Mediterranean Sea and the Eastern Ocean was the Indian Ocean. And uh, the pepper used to sell for three times the price of gold. So they called it black gold. Today, the most expensive pepper that is actually the most tasty is telecherry, which is up here. So if you can get some telecherry and compare it to the black pepper, you'll see the difference. Also, people are growing black pepper in different parts of the world. So they have slightly different properties and they have different tastes. So the crappy stuff we get in the US in the grocery store, um, I stopped buying about 10 years ago and I just carry it in my suitcase um, when I go back and it's just, of much, much superior quality than anything we find in America. And then I talk about cinnamon. So it has original source in Sri Lanka, which is looking like this. It's a sweeter variety. And this one is cassia, which is called cinnamon. It's actually a Chinese product most of the time. And it's got a thicker bark and it has a much more pungent flavor. So you can see this as well. And, um, uh, there, you know, there's there's people writing about it. So <clears throat> let's talk about one of the most sacred substances. There are about 30 ifs, ands, or buts around key. However, with that known, if you make proper key in the right way or buy it from the right place from a geared cow who has grazed on green grass in the pasture in the sun, or he or she, or she right, cow, um, can uh, orient herself to the north-south magnetic pole when she eats, is able to choose her own green that she eats and wander around all day. And when she produces milk, she gives the first portion to her own child. That cow's milk is what we are calling milk not the stuff from tin sheds and factory farms of cows. So there's a whole discussion about cow milk that needs to be had. That said, if you can get that cow's milk and make yogurt from it and then make churning it, make the butter come up to the top and then take that butter and within uh, two or three days of that butter, usually we say in 42, uh, 48 hours, make that into ghee. That ghee is golden colored. It has a high amount of conjugate linoleic acid, which is one of the um, uh, essential amino acids that, oh, sorry, essential fatty acids that we cannot produce in our body. So we need to take it in. And it has interestingly very similar properties to our own bilayer of our cells. So we have a lipid bilayer that covers the outer coating of each of our cells. And so this is a very, very nice way to replenish that. And it also brings down all of your um, LDLs and all of the bad fats as we call them. 
So the fact that ghee is about 96% fat is disturbing to people who have read articles that say that ghee is bad for you. But you have to understand that it's about the processing. So if you look at non-nourishing samskara, so samskara means processing. Processing of foods is, has been done forever, like since, you know, beginning of a uh, math but processing it in ways that are known to be okay for the body are different from processing in ways that they can get the government to approve and the industry can make a lot of profit and they never worry about what it does to the human body. These are two different levels of processing. So I have a really favorite lecture um, that's called the seven deadly whites. And I, I have done a lot of research into it in places that are not um, easy to find and found out where these seven deadly foods come from. And one of them was flour because I see so much of gluten, in, uh, gluten sensitivity and intolerance. And I went back and found that in the 1930s, they had found out that wheat, where you take the full wheat berry from these amber waves of grain in, in America, and you can take it and you can hybridize it and you can uh, genetically modify it so it's more hardy and there's not as much insect weight, you know, eaten up waste. And then you can, um, take away the germ, which is very hard to make into flour because it's so uh, fatty. It's got so much of lipid in it. So what they would do is just take away the rest of it, take the germ and either throw it away or, or sell it as wheat germ. And the flour was actually found, found to create heart problems, very berry and vitamin B deficiency. So they had this conference in 1941 in the US and they called all these experts in and they said, well, yes, uh, there's enough data to say that, yes, uh, flour is detrimental. What should we do? And because, you know, it was right before World War II and there were a lot of expense issues and industries don't want to spend any money that they don't have to, they said, okay, okay, we'll just fortify it. So what they did is chemically, they just take out the vitamin B and then they mechanically add in laboratory derived, chemically synthesized vitamin B. Now, that's like saying you are low on hemoglobin in your red blood cells. So you're just going to eat a bar of iron that has been added into your food. And then you're going to expect that that bar of iron is going to be taken across from the stomach into the blood and into your red blood cells. It just doesn't happen. In fact, people die of iron poisoning. So in the same way, the fortification, if you look on your flour container, it'll say, um, or on the package, it'll say uh, fortified with vitamin B and minerals. It's an artificial fix for a problem. So in India, what we talk about is gehu, which is the Hindi word for the whole wheat berry. And those are purchased by people in the market. And then they are taken to either hand mills, which are like two foot high, or they're taken to people who do this professionally. And you know, if once a month or whenever your, your flour runs out and you have the person hand pulverize in their machine, it's called a pishna machine. So that means to pulverize and you get fresh whole wheat flour. You make your rotis or your chapatis, whatever you're gonna make and you have your wheat flour fresh. And those people never get gluten sensitivity. So there's a lot of issues around these seven deadly whites and we can go through each one of these one by one and learn about them. Um, so I've actually, I've done that in the master classes of my institute and um, all of you are welcome to find them there. The next part is about the food processing that is in the ancient texts. So this is from Pakadarpana and they say there are eight defects that can happen in food. So this is called anaraksha. Raksha means to preserve food properly. Do you know how to preserve food properly? Or do you just take the pan after you've cooked it and eaten from it and just throw it into the refrigerator where the refrigerator is dehydrating and cooling and contracting therefore. And so is that the way that you keep your food? And what happens if you do that? What grows in your fridge? In addition, there are parts about how you should eat uh, food that's processed. So you should process it so that you can eat some of it, you can drink some of it, you can 
absolutely should be licking something at every meal. So that's why we have little achars and chutneys and thick raita so that you can lick that, like take it from your finger and stick it on your tongue and let it embed onto your taste buds. And then there's food that you should be able to chew. So you, you might think, well, there's eatables, but eatables are sometimes very easy to just put in your mouth and swallow like, uh, like rice that is um, watery or like a soup. But chewing something that's solid is also important. And we actually find this in modern medicine where patients in the hospital are given purees and fully uh, liquefied foods because they have problems with swallowing or they have problems with chewing. And what happens is we find that they get leaky gut. The, the closures between cells on the lining of the gut actually get destroyed unless your body detects that you're chewing and eating actually chewing some food. So these are things that were somehow understood in the ancient times. So in addition, there are components of food that we can go through six different components of how the food should be made and the properties it should have inside of it. And what should be santarpana, which means that it should be building up your tissues of your body, not your fat tissue, but your muscle tissue, your organ tissues, your blood, and very strongly your plasma tissues, as well as your bone. And those don't always happen with the food that we're eating today. And then from the book that you saw earlier, the Kshema Kutuhadam, there's different types of cooking of food. So all of these are detailed in modern medicine, uh, sorry, in uh, ancient medicine and not at all in modern medicine. So I'm gonna turn over to a couple of other principles beyond uh, food processing and about how we process. So how we taste is actually known to be about the taste buds. There used to be a myth that we have taste areas in our tongue. So one part is sweet and detects sweet, another part detects sour. It's just, that's it, it, been found to be actually false. Every part of the tongue has every taste bud. And it turns out there are actually three main types of taste buds. One is the salty taste, but I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me make this a little bit bigger for now. There's a salty taste bud. There's the sour taste bud. So the salty obviously lets salt through like sodium. Sour lets acids through, which have a hydrogen proton complex. And then the other is a subtype of what we call the sweet bitter umami. So sweet bitter umami are all one basic type of taste receptor, but they somehow modulate depending on the taste that they take in. And these taste buds are on the cells of our tongue. And then they go right from the taste bud up into these different parts of the brain where the brain not just coordinates the taste, but looks at your experience in the past. So here are the taste buds. They go up through the vagus nerve, through the tongue up into the, this is the um, upper part of the spinal column, and then up into the brain, into the various parts that look at taste, but it turns out there's a lot to do with your memory, your emotion, and your personality. It's not the same for everyone, which is very interesting. So different people have different responses in their brain to different sweet receptors and the way in which they perceive sweet. There are also in these six tastes, sweet, sour, salty, pungent, bitter, astringent, where the umami in the last slide is a combination of katu, which is pungent, and chaya, which is astringent. These three, we don't really experience in the Western flavors, but in Asia, these three are very, very prominent. And the chemical substances that create those tastes have been worked out if you're into chemistry, right? Here's the slide I was talking about with the human gut microbiome. What they found out is that the microbiome is all over the body and that the taste receptors are not just on the tongue, but they're all the way from the tongue to the testes, all over the gut, but in many, many other kinds of tissues. And the question is as to why. And that's a very interesting discussion about how taste actually is programmed in our brain, but it also sends signals down to different parts of our body to respond to our perception of taste so that we can orient digestive enzymes and various responses from our insulin in our pancreas or our glucagon in our pancreas or different liver digestive production uh, molecules like bile, bile acids and various um, fatty acid transformation molecules. 
and, and everything you've learned about digestive enzyme molecular basis, all of that seems to come together in a physiologic way here. This is a wonderful list of the Gurvadi Gunas, the 20 Gunas that come in food. So these are the Gunas in Sanskrit. Uh, there are translations which are actually kind of wrong. So I go through the shloka that explains that these words are actually verbs and they have a karma or a uh, action. So the verb has been translated. This is, sorry, this is a partially translated version of the slide. And the meaning in English comes through. So when you say guru, most people think that means heavy. It's a heavy food. So, you know, something like a meat casserole or a very heavy multi-grain bread. Actually, guru means to nourish because it will bring in nourishment to your cell. And so the cell is going to grow. It's going to be heavier in the materialistic form, and that's going to give it weight. And so that is the carriage from the word brahmana to nourish into the word guru, which people translate as heavy. But in between, you could see that what I was saying translates very differently to foods. So multigrain food is actually heavy to digest, but it's not nutritive because the body cannot simultaneously do digestion of different grains at the same time. And so people that have very strong fire, like a Punjabi farmer that's working on the fields 12 hours a day, she can probably have multigrain uh, meals like roti and rice. But for those of us who sit at desks or um, sit around all day watching soap operas or are doing our meditation all day but don't have good pranayam and we don't have good digestive fire, we have some kind of disease. Those of us should not be having foods that are heavy to digest. So we shouldn't be having multigrain foods. So we go through each of these and foods that are examples of each of these. And most foods have more than one. But I read the details of four pieces. I put this slide in here to remind us all that while uh, modern medicine says, oh, Ayurveda doesn't work, I don't have any evidence, the evidence in primary care for uh, modern medical interventions, including recommendations of um, foods actually shows that only a minority of the outcomes they use healthcare interventions are supported by high quality evidence. And there is a group that looked at a whole bunch of recommendations of modern medicine that only 18% are grade A. This gentleman, Ionadis, is someone to follow because he really looks at how modern medicine really doesn't have the evidence that it kind of pretends to have. And so that also plays out when we talk about food as we find a lot of these things just aren't working. So one of the things that brought this to light was COVID when people found that actually uh, COVID was so scary for some people because they didn't understand how to take care of it. Now in the modern medical world, Apologies, I just got cut off again. Let me share my screen again. Um, as I was saying, in modern medicine, there was a sense that COVID was virus and people were scared. And so those people that followed modern medicine did all kinds of stuff. But in Ireland, we had a whole bunch of people who had mild symptoms and the recommendations included Ayurvedic aspects of diet that I have been discussing. And so when people really focused on their diet, it could resolve not only long COVID or severe COVID, but it was pretty obvious from the Ayurvedic nutrition community that the way in which you eat affects your nutrition and therefore will affect pandemic type diseases like COVID. So this is actually one that it's a case report that we put together. It's in a peer reviewed medical journal um, and uh, it's a pretty nice thing that we were able to contribute that to the medical world where modern doctors are just not at all aware of how other medical systems treat diseases using food. This slide I put in here so you understand foods grow differently in different environments. So there are three different types of environments. And if you lived in a moist, marshy land, not only are you gonna get different trees, but things that you put in your garden 
that you've taken from seeds from arid lands are going to grow differently and have different chemicals in them. And so they have the same chemical or physiologic basis of working, um, especially according to Ayurveda Punas. This is how I personalize. You can find this on my intake form in my private practice, which you can find on my website that was on that first slide. And what I do is I ask people about their intake of everything that's ahara. So what do you take in through your mind? How do you process out through your poop? And what kind of symptoms do you get in the way in which you digest your food? Do you digest your food properly? And so uh, here I put the A, B, C, D, E, F that I teach everyone to follow so that they can figure out how they're processing their food. These A, B, C, D, E, F are also written here. And um, when you assess the way in which you eat, does your food give you fatigue? Do you have great bowel movements? Do you have cravings after you eat? After you go through all these indices, you can figure out whether or not you need to change your diet. Um, I'll just couple more slides and then we'll take questions. And I'll go through these very quickly. In Ayurveda, we look at how to eat by looking at different factors. And these 10 factors, actually, I just put together a video series detailing them so that you can understand them in detail uh, for yourself and how to think. These are all Sanskrit concepts of the fact that your mind, your environment, and the way that you process food is going to determine how you take in other foods and how you should set it up for prescription, obviously. We also talk about minerals and metals. So this is the human metalome and all the different minerals we require in our body. So it's just false to think metals are all heavy metals and dangerous. What's dangerous is if you don't process the metals to come into your body, like you eat a bar of iron versus processing it into a hot form that can be taken in, uh, you have problems. And modern medicine is still at that place where it's still not understanding how to process minerals to get them into the body as deeply as in the crevices of DNA. So we need to understand from ancient sciences how to do that better. Here are some of the foods you can eat that have large amounts of bioavailable Sorry, I'm not sure how much of that you got cut off, but I hope you got to see this and I hope one can verify for me that you could hear the last slide about the metals. Just wait to make sure. Okay, great. Thank you, Aditi. And so uh, back down to the DNA level, we have you know small pieces of zinc going and stabilize the DNA. So we need to have that. How to do it in our diet? Oops, sorry. We can take foods from the brassica family, the dark green leafy vegetables. This is a great way to get this because the best nanotechnologists on the planet are um, the plants because they go down into the soil, they take the minerals, they sort them out in parts per million, they put them into their leaves and stems and bark and they are able to partake of them in a bioavailable way, not in a lab chemistry purified way. And the bioavailable way sets them up in a structure that the biological living being which you can recognize. If you, uh, well, we don't need this. Um, if you want to read more about it, you should learn about plant-based diets and how people are uh, bringing those forward. I did have a link to, hmm. So, okay, so in this series of columns that I do, this is a newspaper column, I talk about foods every week, and this is called the South Asia Times. I think I show it here. There we go. This is the substack where I have these columns, and you can read about these in layperson's language, and I have like a hundred and some columns on different, different aspects of foods and uh, different aspects of Ayurveda. And... Uh, Fasting is another aspect we talk about, and there's a whole science of fasting. It's also come up in the medical literature that actually it turns out that fasting is good because before they would say fasting for religious purposes is dangerous. And now they're saying caloric restriction is very good and that intermittent fasting is very good. There's also a factor of 
Kala Bhojanam, which is the time in which we eat. So it's who you eat with, what you have on the table when you eat, how it looks, uh, when to eat, where to eat, why you're eating certain foods, and then how to prepare those foods, but how to eat them and how to space between different foods. And that whole science of Kala Bhojanam is uh, pretty well understood, actually. Um, this is a slide from PNAS, a very prestigious biological, biomedical physiology journal, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA. And they finally discovered that actually there are many parts of the uh, brain that influence the stomach. So what Ayurveda says is that whatever you eat from age six months to six years, which is this slide, it's called okasatmya. This is what you learn as your baseline of normal. And if you learn to eat in a certain way, because your, you know, your parents are teaching you that way, from six months to six years, whatever you eat is programmed as your factory. It's like you building a factory with certain machines and me building another one with different machines. Some of the machines might overlap, but some of them are unique. And so if you grow up eating kelp and sushi and uh, sticky rice in Japan, and I grow up eating idli and sambar, and someone else has cornflakes and uh, whatever is called milk in the U.S. with fruits and orange juice and peanut butter, we're all going to have different machinery, and that's what's going to be yummy for us in the morning, and that's what we're going to crave in the morning, and it's all going to be different. That principle is called okasatmya, and that's why you can't say there's one good breakfast for everyone. Uh, real quick, there are the rules in compatible foods. You guys can ask about that. And next time, next week, we're going to talk more about living rhythms in the planet and how we adjust to them. So I know I'm seven minutes over time, but I'm going to stop sharing my slides and turn on my video and uh, see if there are any questions. I know I ran through the last set of slides on purpose very quickly because I'm hoping that you'll remember some of it and have some questions peaked in your mind so that next week when we start, we can review some of those slides and then continue with the ones um, that I haven't shown. And uh, Aditi, are there any questions that I need to answer? Thank you all for listening. Yes, we'll just open the floor for questions and the participants can ask, just one second. I think Promita has her hand up. Yeah, good morning, doctor. I have a whole lot of questions, but I won't bother you with all those right now. I just I would like to just quickly know about the urad dal that you mentioned that is uh, very bad uh, uh, for our health. But uh, as we know, in South India, uh, this dal is quite uh, predominant. You know, people usually eat this in a uh, uh, in majority. So is it because the, the other day when I was hearing your lecture, you mentioned that the ecology that we are kind of used to, if we are used to eating something that won't harm our bodies. So uh, is it like we have to altogether give up this for, uh, uh, for no. our health or? No, 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 you're, you're completely going off on. So first of all, good and bad is a Christian concept. And unfortunately in India, we've okay. been so influenced by good and bad, right and wrong, you know, good and evil. There's nothing like that in our Sanskrit language. That's all Christian stuff. So there is useful and unuseful. There's harmonious and unharmonious. If your ka, your empty space is in harmony, that's called sukha. That doesn't mean happiness. That's a regional language word. So the masha, which is the uradal, is heavy to digest. That is why it is considered to be unharmonious. So when I say it's good for your system, it means it brings harmony and digestion to your body. Most people who are having any kind of food problems have a harder time digesting urad dal than they have with mung dal. And that is why urad dal should not be favored in people that are having digestive issues. However, there is that slide of okasatmya. If you are accustomed to eating urad dal every day and in your sambar in the morning, you put a little bit of urad dal because it's heavy, it's grounding, and you find that it's fine for you, have it because you have sambar. But if you're a Bengali and you don't have good digestive fire that day and you don't eat urad dal because you don't eat sambar every morning, you have, you know, um, alu with jira and kalonji in it, then if you eat urad dal, 
it's too heavy for you and you can't digest it, it's going to be a problem. If you've mm -hmm. ever cooked urad, you know that it has a sticky, sticky pop, right? Yes, urad yes. flour is very sticky. So do you want that stickiness in your body when your body's already having problems with stickiness that it can't digest? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so it's not bad for you. And mm -hmm. people that are used to eating it can have it. But if you are having problems with digestion, then consider it to be not harmonious for your system. All right. Thank you so okay. much, doctor. Another uh, quick one is about the salt that you mentioned. Uh, can I quickly ask which salt should be uh, used? Because we can altogether give up sugar, but salt is something that we can't uh, do without. We need salt to cook our food. So if you, so can you should never give us. up sugar. You yeah. should never give up sugar. That is just okay. one of the most ridiculous things that we've learned in modern medicine. You cannot give up eating sugar because it is part of the happiness. The okay. verb that comes with sugar is it's called madhura it means to be wholesome to be fulfilled if you're not fulfilled mm -hmm. then why are you living you might as well just die you have to have fulfillment so yes. sugar is not the refined granulated poison that you guys are all buying from the market sugar is that which has that sweet flavor but has a wholesomeness so it includes jaggery it includes ikshu or ak which is the sugar cane that you take in your bite and suck that has medicinal properties because your saliva meets with the sugar cane and creates medicine but if you take that sugar cane and you make it into granulated sugar then it's poisonous so there's jaggery there's honey there's ikshu which is the ak there's the fruits that are in them and you should be having them and you should have them in ways that are appropriate for the harmony of your body, which almost no one learns. Okay, so that's the little caveat about sugar. The salt, there's no good salt, but everyone needs salt. And the bad salt is the table salt, which is NaCl 100% that is made by factories or is the byproduct usually of mining and uh, these industries that are basically pulling things out of the ground and isolating out the dangerous byproducts that are not the metal or the coal that they want. And then that garbage that's there, they pull out the NaCl and then they chemically produce it into NaCl and then they sell that. That's why a big kilo packet is only like 30 rupees in India because it's, it's a waste for them. So, you know, it's, it's uh, chemically made for them. Now, if you want to have what, is more biologically better. You can have sea salt, which is pure dried sea salt. Right? You can have mountain salt. So rock salt from the Andes, rock salt from the Himalayas, rock salt from the Alps. These are available. Um, you can have seaweed that has salts in it. So that's ocean salt. It's kind of like sea salt, but it's you know sitting in a fibrous plant-based leaf, which is the algae or the kelp. And if you have medical problems, sometimes we say to get salt from the Sindhu. So the Sindh is in Northwest India or Northeast Pakistan. And the caves of the Northwest Himalayas in the Sindh make Saindav. So of Sindh is Saindav. So Saindav salt is a cooling salt because it has minerals embedded within the NaCl of salt that give you a slightly different flavor, a slightly different smell and different color because of those trace minerals. That is a medicinal salt. And then there's like four or five other kinds of salts as well that are in the um, Ayurvedic literature. And there's about 20 or 30 that are in the cooking culinary world. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yes, very much. And I would appreciate if you can please uh, post the links of your articles where you can further read about all this. I've already uh, done that. I've already uh, done in, that. In the slides, already, is it? Yes. So if you go back into this recording in Substack, yes. that has all the articles that I've written. And if okay. you want to be part of the Dinacharya, that was on the first slide. So you can join the Dinacharya classes and then pick out those two quarters that I mentioned where we talk about the individual yeah. foods one by one. And I think there was um, maybe one other link I gave for Ayurveda, which Dr. Aditi has already posted into the yeah. 
child. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Gratitude. Welcome. There are a few questions in the chat box. So yes. I'll just uh, read it for you. Let's start with Madhavi's question. That was the first one. Yes. What is the way in which I can understand? Uh, okay, just to uh, deepen. So what I always tell people is you have to start where you are. So you have deep knowledge, but you have it disconnected. Some of you, like me, have been miseducated. So I learned things a certain way because I went to medical school and they don't teach about foods. And the greatest evidence for that is look at how we are fed in our hostels and in our hospitals when we are going through medical school residency and becoming doctors. We are fed terrible foods that are processed foods. So doctors by and large don't learn anything about nutrition. Nutritionists learn about calories and foods according to biochemical medicine and dietetics as well. Food scientists learn how to make foods and make profit from them. So they're not learning how to make sure that the foods are healthy for the human body. So start with where you're at and then start reading about Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is 10 Ayurvedic doctors and me. We are writing about foods from a very authentic place, going back to the Shastras, interpreting, interpreting it for modern times. We also, um, so I have my weekly newspaper column that you can always get from that Substack, and that's got lots of stuff in it. And I think that's the best way to start. If you can find someone, though it's rare, who really understands food and how to tailor it to you, then that's also good. And there's probably, I will say there's about 10 people in India who really know how to do it that I have met. Probably there's a few more, but they really can answer every question you have about food. So I would start reading on your own first and then you know pray to the heavens and one of those 10 people will come in front of you. So Madhavi, if you have anything else to ask, please, uh, uh, show yourself and Aditi will unmute you. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, we'll move on then. Ah, yes, hi. You got to unmute yourself. Madhavi, we can't hear you. Uh, can, am I audible now? Yes. Good morning, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. I am uh, a nutritionist and you rightly said that being a dietitian and a nutritionist also what we basically learn is in terms of calories and we don't really, you know, gain uh, the insights like you have explained uh, during the session. And the desire, of course, is to learn the authentic, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, gain the authentic insights into how food is actually medicine in the purest form and how we can uh, overcome uh, lifestyle issues or uh, health conditions with food and food alone and a healthy lifestyle, of course. So as you've said, uh, yes, I shall pray and one of those 10 people, uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully in this lifetime appear in front of me and I gain more insight, but I'll definitely stay connected and read more from the links that you've provided. And since you're a nutritionist, you'll learn fast because you already know what you sense is wrong and you know what your nani or dadi or takuma taught you. So you're trying to resolve these two, as I did, because this is what my mother did and this is what I was being taught in medical school. And I would come home and argue with her. And she would say to me, okay, just wait six months. An article will come out that tells you that this is bad or wrong. You know, today red wine is good. Tomorrow red wine will be bad. Today, our coffee is good. Tomorrow, coffee will be bad. Today, milk is bad. Tomorrow, it'll be good. And sure enough, she was right. And I realized that this was consistent and right because our ancestors handed down to their grandchildren, their grandchildren, to their grandchildren, to their grandchildren. And so our lineage of Indian food eating in your area of, if you still live where you're natively from, that knowledge is handed down uninterrupted, generation to generation. It doesn't go wrong because we watch it. If my child doesn't grow up well drinking goat milk, I'm not going to drink goat milk. If my child grows up bad on packet milk, but did well, or I did well on gai kadood from the goshala, I'll go and hunt for a goshala because I know that packet dood is not good. Packet dood, for those of you outside of India, is where you have these small plastic packets of uh, half a liter, 500 ml of milk, which is processed milk. It's not from the cow. So these kind of evidences for someone like you 
Just think about what you know and what your questions are. Write them down. That's part of the sadhana. And what you'll find is that someone will show up to answer the questions if you, you know, do your sadhana, which of course you have Dr. Bijlani to guide you on that, but it'll come. Okay. We'll move on to some other questions. Yes. So that was a great question from Madhavi. I think that that applies to several of you who are trying to learn. Um, Navneet is asking, Navneet Kukreja, who somehow I know your name, Navneet, um, do we have dosha-wise recommended foods? We do, but how do you know what to do with the doshas is the question. Because if your disease state or your imbalance is a particular dosha, how do you know the dosha in your season, in your environment, the dosha in the time of day, the dosha in your part of life, and the doshas from your different disease imbalance conditions with your prakriti dosha. Because you and your foods, because your prakriti is usually out of balance uh, if you're trying to do dosha wise recommended foods. If you are super healthy and you have excellent prakriti, then you can say that, okay. This is my dosha. I'm a pitta kapha. I need to eat a certain amount of foods that will support my kapha, will balance my vata, and I have a lot of fire because I'm a pitta kapha, so I need to eat foods that are cooling, fresh, and sweet. That's if you're in balance, but most people are not. If you're a little obese, if you have a thyroid problem, if you have lipid issues, if you have Sinusitis, it means that you should not eat according to the Pitta Kapha diet. You should eat according to the diet of, uh, as I said, all those factors. Okay. So, Navneet, I hope that answers your question. If you have something else, then please let me know. Okay, we'll go on then. Um, are these seven deadly foods white deadly for us? Uh, yes, that's why they're called deadly foods. So, yeah, I mean, I don't understand your question. They're called deadly foods because the way they're processed is that they are dead. Uh, so do yeah, so doctor, I wanted to understand, you know, we, we have oil in our food, like in our routine, you know, we, we have milk in our routine and also in a routine we eat rice. So I just wanted to understand uh, in what sense it's deadly. Is it like uh, the quantity we eat or, you know, the kind of the quality we eat, how it comes to being okay. a dead. So back up so we can see you because right now we're just seeing your nose. Yeah, back up a little bit. So Ritika, uh, thank you for your question. Wonderful. It's not that the food in all forms is deadly. And it's not that the food is healthy in all forms. That was a slide on food processing. So those are the seven foods that when they're not processed properly, they are deadly. And most of us are eating them in processed ways. So it's an urgency, it's a request for you to get to know the way in which the food is processed so you know which one to choose. Oils should be unrefined. There are only four or five good oils. The rest of them should not be used because of the way they're processed. So as long as you mention oils, ghee, we talked about ghee and how it should be processed, unrefined mustard oil, unrefined sesame oil, and unrefined coconut oil. If you're outside of India, um, unrefined olive oil. And if you're in Africa, unrefined palm oil. But everything else is not oil that's good for the human body. And especially if it's refined. So it's the refined oil. So now you get refined Fortuna or Amway or Patanjali refined mustard oil. Don't have that. Some people say to me, it's three times more expensive to get the unrefined oil. Okay, so don't have that. And then when you get sick, you can spend that money for your hospital treatment, right? Instead, if you can just have proper uh, foods, then you're not gonna have the same you know, issues, right? Okay, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, um, I am aware that we need to stop. So I'll just ask Dr. Aditi how much more time we have or should we wait until next week? Dr. Aditi, please uh, confirm. Yes, we can maybe just take one more question and then we can maybe later on take it in the next class or they can write to you, we'll just. Okay, great. So the next question was, um, oh gosh, there's so many good questions here. Okay, next time I'll start with these questions. The next one in order is from Anjana. 
who says, I wish to go for fasting, but body feels hungry, how to manage it and do fasting. So a lot of people need to step up toward fasting. You can't just go for fasting when you're not used to doing it. And the way to start is uh, to have an, a sense of what makes you feel full and how long you can stay full. So if you're not having high quality ingredients, you're gonna get hungry faster because your body's cells are saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, even if you've eaten. If you have calories that are empty, like potato chips or um, I don't know, some um, refined rice, then you'll have a whole bunch of rice. You'll say, I ate so much of rice, but I'm not full. You need to change your rice. Maybe go for local rice and you'll see that you get fuller faster. If you have whatever you're eating and it's not filling you and you're not able to stay full for four to five hours, you're not eating healthy foods, especially if you eat more than twice the energy. So if I take my hands together, take this amount, see what that looks like for you, right? Close off the gap. This is the amount I can hold in my hand. Don't go like this because it'll fall out. Go like this and take that amount and make a bowl and then pour that out into the bottom, into a dish. Measure that amount. That amount is what you should be eating. So for me, it's a third cup. For some people, it's one fourth cup. For some people, it's one half cup twice of those. So if mine is a third cup, I should be eating two thirds cup of food. That's all. Now, if I'm eating this much rice, that's way more than two thirds cup. That means my rice is not right. That means I need to maybe fry a little bit of ghee into the rice so I get extra basis, but it has to be high quality foods. And then once you're full on that one meal and you can figure that out, go from eating three meals or snacks and three meals to three meals and then to two meals and then go to where you can eat two meals and the first meal is very filling and the second meal is less filling so this should be when the sun when the fire is high in the sky the fire is high in the belly so 10 30 11 o'clock uh today in, in the middle of india like up in the mountains it doesn't get hot till about 11 30 12 but in banaras it's getting hot at 9 a.m so you can have your morning meal at 9 9 30 and then see how long that goes. Once you can do that, which might take you a month to get to, then you can try half a day of fasting. And then you can try um, fasting with water. And then you can try the nirjala, which is the complete taking nothing in by mouth. But many people can't get to that when they're sick. If you don't have enough nutrients in your cells, you shouldn't be fasting. And if you have you know, diseases that are preventing you, then you shouldn't be doing full day fasting. You should be just doing those part ways that are right for you. If your mother-in-law makes you fast, like you have to fast, otherwise uh, the, you know, your, your uh, the, the family name will go away if you don't fast. So mother-in-laws that are bullies need to be told, I'm sorry, you know, I, I can't fast that way. But for the rest of the people, they should learn how to fast. And so kids learn this from the age of like 10 or 12, their parents help them learn. If you haven't learned it, don't do it, uh, what they call cold turkey. Don't, you know, don't start right away. So we'll end with that question. If you wanna say anything about fasting uh, to end that, um, Anjana, that would be fine. Otherwise we'll end there. You can unmute yourself, Anjana, so we can hear you. One th uh, doctor, thank you very much. One thing more I want to ask that uh, while doing that yoga practice in the morning, I start feeling hungry. What's that? This problem comes with me. Means according to the time, it's eight and nine. It's my minister. I feel that very. Means, yeah, that means that your body is not getting nutrified. The day before, whatever you ate is not healthy food for you. So your body is still hungry. So you need to look at what your ingredients are. Stop eating polished rice. Stop eating maida. Stop eating packet dood. Stop eating tata salt. Stop eating granulated sugar. Go get some jaggery. See what happens when you eat one teaspoon of sugar in your tea or morning whatever you have versus one teaspoon of jaggery. The jaggery will make you feel more full. So when you have nutrients and minerals in your food that are useful, your body is not going to get hungry at eight in the morning, unless you're a farmer. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you go outside and you're farming for three hours from five to eight in the morning before you come inside. We can't hear you, Anjana. 
We can't hear you. It's okay now? Yeah. I wake up around 4.45 in the morning, 4.45 and 5. And for 5.30 to 6.30, we are going for a yoga practice. And around 8, I feel hungry. Okay. And, uh, and I and uh, uh, just listen one thing because I'm I'm facing this problem. Why I'm so hungry? At around eight eight thirty, I take my fr uh, breakfast. In that, I take fruits. Most of the time, fruits. And one okay. cup of tea. Tea I need. Tea I take. Okay. And after that, again at eleven, I take my breakfast. So I feel. Wait 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 wait. wait, wait. So. You need to sit down with someone and work on this. But the night before, you need to be having, by seven o'clock, you need to be having good food. It's great that you do your yoga and it makes sense why you're hungry because after you do full pranayama and asana, you're going to be a little hungry. But don't start with fruits. Start with a grain. Have either poha, have um, suji halwa, have roti, have bhate bhat. The best thing you could do is have panta bhat, which is, um, watery rice, the water and the rice will be very good for you. Okay. Have that at eight o'clock and see if you do well with that. You don't have to have a huge amount. Just have this amount and don't have fruits in the morning. Okay. Because you're too hungry. Someone else might also do class with you. Dr. Bijlani might do class with you and he's hungry at eight, but he's not that hungry. So he doesn't need to do the adjustment. You do because your body is crying for nutrients at eight in the morning. And you can't just give it fruits. You need to give it a grain and put something, put a little ghee in there and put uh, some vegetable, one vegetable. You can use moringa. That'll help you very quickly because moringa has a lot of um, nutrients in it. Moringa is called drumstick or sigru, okay? So... Um, try that for a couple of days and next week when we come back you can report to us and tell us what you did to help shift yourself okay okay Great. okay thank you welcome we've gone over time i apologize to all of you and to dr aditi please dr I, aditi yes uh, the next questions whatever are remaining we can take up in the subsequent session i've noted them down so maybe we can start from there and uh, i would just like to hand over to dr Bijlani to just speak briefly, and then we come to the close of the session, sir. So. Thank you, Dr. Bhaswati Bhattacharya. Uh, you have uh, straddled many worlds uh, in your childhood. You've seen uh, the uh, traditional knowledge at work uh, through your parents and uh, other close relatives. Then you went to medical school and saw what modern science has to offer. And then that, uh, in fact, motivated you to go to Ayurveda which you have again become an expert in. <laughs> so you bring here a wonderful synthesis uh, and uh, that is what this course will also achieve because uh, uh, the other speakers uh, will bring in their own uh, sort of inputs and uh, I might uh, tilt the balance a little more in favor of modern science, uh, having been exposed more to that. And that also does have something to offer. Uh, and it is the synthesis that we have to work towards. The modern science, in fact, uh, has uh, had a hypnotizing effect on most of us who have been exposed to it. And uh, uh, that is something which we have to avoid. Because one be beautiful thing that you pointed out was that uh, in modern science, knowledge about nutrition has been changing every few years. And uh, just to give a few examples, I have seen that happen. There was a time when we were talking in terms of uh, unsaturated fats being the best because they lower blood cholesterol levels. That was sometime in the 1950s and 60s. So the more unsaturated, the better. No ghee, nothing saturated. And uh, the result was that uh, we had extremely unbalanced fat intake and uh, fats which hardly had any N3 fatty acids. The fact that the body survived those uh, lopsided fats speaks a lot about the resilience of the body. But then soon we discovered that uh, the N3 and N6 ratio, which had uh, reached some ridiculous levels like one is to 30, whereas tra the traditional diets is just about one is to five or less than that, was something that was not really doing much good to the body. So by the 1990s, we started talking about a more balanced fat intake. But uh, uh, what the sad part is that uh, what went on from the 1950s to the 1990s, this emphasis on unsaturated fats, uh, 
uh, on one hand built up a lot of industry around those oils and flower oil and things like that. And on the other hand, the doctors, as you said, don't know much about nutrition. So they continue to get influenced by the press and the advertisements. And uh, the cardiologists sometimes even these days say that no ghee, ghee is full of saturated fat. You know, that is something which cardiologists are seeing in today. Uh, then, you know, things like dietary fiber. The modern world, I mean, modern science, we started learning about its value sometime from the 1970s onwards. And uh, the result is that uh, in 1960s, when I was in medical school, the uh, treatment for peptic ulcer was a low fiber diet. But then fortunately that has changed. Now we talk of a high fiber diet for both prevention and treatment of peptic ulcers. So in modern science, knowledge has been changing. The only beautiful part is that modern science has been open to change. It takes long, it takes several studies, several studies which have not been motivated by extraneous factors. And, uh, but sooner or later, truth has a power of its own and truth emerges and it has a staying power that uh, helps us, uh, if we are a little critical in looking at the data, it helps us see how, uh, what to take from modern science, what to reject. So, you know, as Sri said that if we accept something, it should be because we understand it. And if we reject something, that should also be because we understand it. So since I mean, people like you understand both modern science and Ayurveda, you are in the best position to decide uh, what to accept, what to reject, and then work out what again Sri calls critical assimilation. So thank you again. And I think we'll have several sessions with you. The next one, of course, is next Thursday. But after that, maybe we'll have a yes talk by you on just the seven deadly uh, foods, uh, which is one of your favorite sessions. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Our, yes. next uh, our next class will be on Monday. That will be a practical class. And tomorrow, Friday evening, we have a yes talk. So all of you are interested are invited to join us for Friday talk as well. And we just end with a short music. Once again, thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. We look forward to many more sessions from you. Thank you, everyone. Namaste to all. Thank you.